so many thanks for like the people who, who are there in spite of the the craziness of the of the usual september um uh, yes so as Damien said um, i will talk about uh, problems when we have missing data and uh, and and but first like since uh, the since it's uh, it's an intro i will start by just introducing my, myself quickly uh, so um, I uh, I did my PhD in Paris. Uh, uh, well, well, first of all, I, I mostly work on machine learning, and I guess more on the statistical side of machine learning. And I did my PhD in Paris on uh, working on problems where you have when you observe a, l a large number of variables at the same time, uh, for instance in genomics or, or stuff like that. And then I did a postdoc in uh, in Copenhagen when I started working uh, more on. Uh, on on, uh, on deep learning models, so models that, that, that use uh, neural networks. Uh, and in particular, I've been working on a kind of models that I will talk about today called deep generative models that are essentially statistical models that leverage deep learning, as I will explain in a few slides. And I started at INRIA uh, around two years ago in fall 2019, so a few months before COVID. <laughs> and, um, and I've been mo working mostly on deep learning and its connection with the statistics. Uh, regarding applications, uh, I've been working mostly on medical applications and uh, a lot on problems where we have uh, what we may call dirty data. So for instance, missing values or anomalies or problems where we have pre-processing issues. Um, and uh, I didn't write it in the slide, but I'm a member of the MySci team which is a machine learning team which was created like uh, around one uh, and a half years ago. Um, all right, so uh, the work I'm going to present today is joint work with two Danish research researchers, uh, Nils Ibsen and uh, Jes Felsen, uh, who are both at the Technical University of Denmark, uh, like in the north of Copenhagen. And uh, the material that, that uh, we'll cover today is uh, included in, in those three papers. Um, all right, so uh, as I mentioned, I, I've been working in the past few years on deep latent variable models, or deep generative models, uh, which are um, a kind of statistical models that uh, use deep learning as a building block. Uh, so the most famous examples are two more sort of models called virtual autoencoders, uh, VAEs, and uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, GANs. And there are many ways to uh, look at those models, but one way that we really like is just to see those as nonlinear generalizations of uh, much simpler and older models like, uh, pro uh, like PCA uh, or factor analysis. And the, the common theme of, for instance, of PCA or factor analysis or other models like topic models is to uh, summarize the data into a code uh, and to do this summary in a probabilistic fashion. And the idea of deep latent variable model is exactly the same except that we have some deep learning block inside. So, uh, so usually the model is uh, it's just written like this. So uh, we want to model some data X. So X is the data that we have. It could be image. So X could be an image. X could be a sound. X could be uh, like electronic health records of the, of the patient or a molecule, any, any sort of thing. Um, and we want to model X using some sort of compact information that we will call a, a code and this compact information will be z and the idea is that uh, once you have z you can generate x by passing z through uh, a function called the decoder that will be a deep neural network that will be the link between our compact code and our complex data and when we pass our code for our decoder, for our neural net, we will get a distribution of our data points, uh, so P of X given Z. Um, and this, this distribution will be parameterized by this uh, deep neural network. Uh, and this idea is really just to uh, have an, an, a neural net uh, uh, transform very simple codes into a very complex distributions. And, uh, and so typically, if I want to sample from this model, I just First of all, sample a bunch of codes according to, again, a simple distribution, typically, typically Gaussian. So we just sample a bunch of Gaussians according to P of Z. So P of Z will typically be a Gaussian. And then I will pass them through my uh, decoder, which is, a, again, a deep neural net. And then the output of my decoder will give me uh, a probability distribution of, um, of X given Z. So typically, again, a simple one, like a Gaussian, with mean, for instance, 
the output of the decoder. But the, the idea is that all the complexity of, the, of this model comes from the, this, uh, de this uh, decoder part, which is uh, again a uh, deep neural net and is highly nonlinear. Uh, but all the other parts are very standard and just, the, again, the distribution of the code is, will typically just be a Gaussian, and this P of X given Z will also typically just be a Gaussian. Uh, so we have a model that is extremely simple except the single parts, which is this decoder that's extremely complex. Which is something I really like about those models. Like the, the whole the complexity can be put into a, a single component. And of course, there are many other varieties of those, but uh, this is like the simplest case. And those models have, have existed since the 90s, but there was some sort of renaissance in 2014 uh, with those three papers uh, Kim Manueling, Rezande, uh, Mohamed Aviestra, and Goodfellow, uh, and co authors, who, who introduced ways of training those. Because those models have, have existed again since the 90s, but the training techniques were a bit clunky. And, um, and those three papers have introduced ways of training those. And again, the two most common recipes are is the one from the variational autoencoder or, or the VAEs that we are going to see today, and the one from GANs, generative adversarial networks, which is also very interesting, uh, but I guess a, more, a, a bit more difficult to set up. So those models have been extremely successful as, as, as modeling very diverse sorts of data, like uh, text or images or even molecules or electronic health records. Um, but like, when we started working on this, we, we noticed that there was no way of handling missing data with those models in a, in a, in a principal fashion. So we, we, we tried to, um, to, to like make those models compatible with missing values. And that would, that's going to be the story of, uh, of today. Uh, so maybe a few words about missing values before I, 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 I start with, uh, with, with the, the, the technical parts. So as Damien said in the beginning, like in practice, missing data are everywhere. Like missing data are the norm rather than the exception when when, when work on real uh, applications of machine learning. So, uh, so for instance, this is a slide that I stole uh, from uh, Julie Joss, who is actually there today. So thanks. Um, uh, this is like a, a, a very big, a quite large scale um, uh, data set from uh, French hospitals, uh, like electronic health records. And uh, for each feature, we have the amount of missing values. And you see that you have a lot of, uh, of features that are in the data sets where more than 50% of the patients um, have missing values for this, for this feature. So basically, it's, that means that if we, if we were to remove all the patients with missing values, we, we would pretty much remove everything. So this is just like some illustration that missing values are, are really everywhere. Um, and of course, I mean, applications such as, such as this one are rather easy to, to find. Uh, but I, I think this one is quite uh, is quite compelling because it shows that really, uh, I mean, like the, the the sheer amount of missing values can be like uh, overwhelming uh, quite often because again, like for a, a bunch of features, you have like more than fifty percent of missing values, which which seems extremely big. Um, and another point that I want to make about missing values is that uncertainty is crucial. Uh, so let's let's look at those very simple examples. So those are digits, but I've chopped off the I sh I've chopped off the top of the digits. So here in black and white, you have uh, some pixels of the digits that we have observed, and in gray above, we have some pixels that are not observed. So the gray pixels are missing. And so the question is like, okay, if we if we only see the bottom of the, of the image, can we decipher if it's a seven or a one? And that seems fairly hard. I mean, because that's, it could be a seven, it could be a, and, but, but it could really be a, a one. And similarly here, if we just see the bottom of this, it could be a five, it could be a three, it could even maybe be a nine. So if we want to handle missing data in that, in that context, it's clear that we can't just make a single bet about and say, okay, we should impute the missing values by, by this, and this is a one, because it might completely be false. And we, so, it's when we when we see these sort of examples, it seems natural to say, okay, we should embrace uncertainty, and we should have some sort of techniques that will uh, handle this uncertainty about the missing values. And the nice thing with those deep generative models I mentioned before is that those are statistical models, so they posit distributions of our data points, and they can handle missing, uh, they can handle uncertainty this way. Um, okay, so. Uh, 
so that, that, that was the general motivation for using those deep GRT models as tools to, to deal with missing values. Uh, so how do, did we do it in practice? So I don't want the talk to be too, too technical, so I'll just put maybe three slides with a bit of math, but I, I will still explain very quickly uh, how, how this works. Again, the model that we're going to look at is the simplest kind of deep GRT model where we first sample some code according to a simple distribution, and then we, we pass them through a neural net to get the distribution of our X. Okay? okay, we sample the code according to something simple, we pass them through a neural net, and then we get the distribution of our X. And now the, the, the tricky part is that now we have missing values. So the simple way of noting this will be that, that we'll, we'll split each data point XI into an observed part XIO. So XIO is the observed part of the data points. So typically XIO would be this. And the missing part of the data point XIM, and again XIM would be this. So each data point is split into two parts. And one part we know, one part we don't know. And the two main questions were, could we train a, a deep GRT model, in part, and in particular a VAE, which is again one of the big fashions of deep GRT models. Can we train a, a model in spite of the missingness? And can we impute the missing values afterwards? Or in the training process, whatever. But can we impute the missing values? Um, and, uh, and so we propose a way of training it. And what, what would seem natural to do in this context would just be to do maximum likelihood, right? Maximum likelihood is a general way of training uh, machine learning models, so we would like to do that, but we can't because of the complexity of the model. And we just proposed a, a simple way of doing approximate maximum likelihood in this context, based on a, a technique called the importance weighted autoencoder, the, the, the I way. Uh, and uh, so we modify this technique um, uh, to handle missing data, and we called our modified technique the missing I way, so the my way. So the my way is just a simple way of doing. Um, uh, maximum like approximate maximum likelihood for this sort of complex models in the presence of missing data. Uh, so after training, we can also impute the data, and we can do two sorts of imputation. A first, a first one called single imputation, which is just that the model gives its best bets about the missing values, and the second kind called single imputation, where we, we give several bets and we embrace uncertainty, as I mentioned before. So uh, rather than, so, okay, so uh, again, there is some technical machinery be, be behind this, but uh, it's not super important. So I'll, I'll, I will show you a few examples of how this works. Uh, so this is just like an example of training a, a deep variety model so, uh, with missing values, and that works as well as without missing values, which is nice, almost as well. And about the imputation, as I mentioned, so this works like this. So the, as I said, uh, the, there is a task called single imputation, which is, giving our best bet about the missing values. And here we have uh, an illustration of what's happening with our algorithm. So here we train the algorithm with the, the top row as a data set. So the data set is, are those digits that are corrupted. And I want to stress that the algorithm has never seen a single full digit. So all the, so all the digits seen by, by the algorithms has been those corrupted ones. Well, not only those ones, but around like 50,000 50, corrupted ones, but not a single one that was full. And we can train it using our technique. And after training, we can do those, this single imputation, this best bet thing, and get those imputations. So the, the second row here, those are, those are single imputations. And as you can see, they look very smooth and quite nice. And we can do the same for another data set, which is actually the same, but with a different corruption process. So here we have another data set where we have chopped off the, the top of some digits. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, the, again, the single imputation, they look quite nice and, uh, and, uh, and quite interesting. But, uh, but those single imputations, again, they are best bets, and they don't embrace uncertainty. And as I mentioned, we would like to embrace uncertainty. So our technique can also do that. And I'll show you an example. So uh, those, this is called multiple imputation. So the first row here are real digits that we don't see. The second row are the versions of the digit that, has, that are seen by, by the algorithm. And, uh, and as you can see, we can generate several bets, several new imputations uh, using our algorithm. And for instance, here it's very clear that it's a two, but our algorithm, we say, okay, maybe it's a two with a, a, a very long tail like this, or maybe it's a two uh, with, a, a bit, a, with a bit more bold like this, uh, or maybe it's a, a bit like, like this, I don't know. But the algorithm is, is, is able to, to, to comprehend that there are different kinds of two. 
And similarly, we, if we go back to the example that we show, that I showed you before, here we we, we at the bottom of a, of a five actually, uh, of a three. Sorry, we at the bottom of a three, but our algorithm is able to see that maybe it's a five, maybe it's a three, uh, maybe it's uh, I don't know something that looks like a nine. So in that case, the algorithm is able to embrace that that uncertainty. Um, I guess I'm almost out of time, so I'll, I'll just show you maybe a, a few more applications. So we extended this, this ID to another kind of missing values called the missing not apparent data, uh, which are missing values that depend, uh, well, it, it's a case of, of, uh, of missing values that's quite complex because the, the fact that a value is missing is dependent with the value of the, of the data themselves. So typically here, yeah, the, so a typical example would be this one, where we can see that uh, the values that are missing uh, are exactly the, uh, almost exactly the, the ones that are above this, this threshold. So if I'm above the threshold, then I will be missing. So it's very complex because like this sort of sensoring is very complex to handle for several technical reasons. And we just pro we propose a way of doing it in the same context, uh, this my way context. And since it's from missing not random data, we call it not my way. That, that's just a point. Um, and we, we, uh, we, we did that on several real data sets, uh, for instance, like uh, collaborative filtering problems, stuff like that. And uh, I, w I just want to finish by uh, showing two other examples from uh, applications by other teams. Uh, so uh, again, the first one by Judy Joss, who is, uh, who is, who is here, and by uh, also Imke Meyer, Felix Raimondo, and Jean-Philippe Ver from Paris. And so they use that um, to model um, uh, incomplete data in a causal inference context. So you want to do causal inference, but you are missing data. And another application by another group of the, the whole technical machinery that we developed uh, uh, was from people from Chris Holmes' team in Oxford. Uh, where they, basically, they did something very similar to what we did uh, for the missing not at random data, uh, but perhaps in a more systema systematic fashion. And, um, and, and they were able to deal with very complex kinds of missing data um, uh, in their paper. Um, uh, yes, uh, thanks. Um.